Data. A software developer's life is filled with uncountable decisions related to data. We can use tons of data sources, aggregate user and sensor data like spoken words, images, acceleration, heartbeat, and these are really just a few. And with people carrying their phones almost 24-7, the ability to track and measure all these data points continuously and in real time isn't fiction, but a reality we must face. As developers, we share a responsibility not just to deal with these technological changes, but also to shape them in a human-friendly way, which is why in this video I'd like to talk about three things. First, I'd like to outline why privacy matters and also give you additional expert opinions on the topic. Second, I want to show you that how we use data shapes our lives. And third, I want to give you concrete suggestions on what developers can do to create software that respects and protects their users' privacy and their dignity as human beings. In a discussion about privacy, have you ever heard anyone saying, I don't have to hide anything? Or have you heard the following quote from former Google CEO Eric Schmidt? In 2009, he said in an interview, if you have something you don't want anyone to know about, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. This mindset implies that only people who have something to hide need to be concerned about privacy. But have you ever done something like this in moments when you felt unwatched? And when someone entered the same room, there is a great chance that you would immediately seize what you were doing, and if you knew someone was watching, you probably wouldn't be doing something that might embarrass you in the first place. Because here's the thing, a feeling of being watched changes how humans behave and even increases conformist behavior. If we have a look at history, then such a mechanism of control was already devised in an architectural way by the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. In the 18th century, he designed the so-called panopticon as a system of control. The concept of the design is to allow prisoners of an institution to be observed by a single security guard without the inmates being able to tell whether they are being watched or not. So if we have a look at today's world of mass surveillance, then data aggregation and analysis by governments is just the tip of the iceberg. We are not only talking about interests of states here, but also about commercial interests of data brokers, ad or analytics companies. All these players are working with different sets of norms and goals. David Baraka and Raphael Goldstein from the Privacy Tech Lab at Wesleyan University are also concerned about how users are unknowingly sharing their data with these players. To me, the bigger human concern is, I think the majority of people are unaware that this is happening. You know, they're unaware that when they open up Zoom, Facebook is even knows that, or, you know, when you're going from site to site, that all these other companies also know that you're opening up a different app. And I think the fundamental human right part is at least letting each individual know what's going on. Um, once once the individual at least knows, then I, I think it's a, it's a different, question of they are, of course, allowed to make their own decisions. But the the important part is they should know exactly who is looking at what they're doing, who is looking at their data, who has access to these things, especially when it comes to ad companies who, you know, there's so many chains of selling and reselling data. And, you know, there's just so many different uh, people along the line that have access, sometimes pretty significant and uh, important uh, details about someone's life. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I feel like uh, as users, we don't understand how much data these companies are collecting and all, like the little trace of data they're collecting. I mean, it just passes our head and we're, all, we're totally unaware. And they're collecting this massive data. And we all have this this like digital footprint online that we we don't know how much of information is there and there's a probably more information online than we actually have you know maybe probably in your room or just locally so 
I think that we, we're definitely entitled to our information and knowing what information is being sold or what company or what information that companies are trying to get. And that that information should be taken care of and we should all have the, the right to, to know how that information is being communicated across different companies and being um, aggregized. Just to illustrate these points a little further, scientists from Cambridge University and Microsoft Research could already demonstrate in 2013 that easily accessible digital records of behavior, namely Facebook likes, can be used to automatically and accurately predict a range of highly sensitive personal attributes, including ethnicity, religious and political views, personality traits, intelligence, happiness, and much more. Cited from their research paper, the scientists concluded, among other things, that one can imagine situations in which such predictions, even if incorrect, could pose a threat to an individual's well-being, freedom, or even life. We already talked about the footprint that we leave behind when we use technology. Just looking at eBay illustrates how many different companies get your data. If you're just browsing the platform to get a piece of equipment or when you sell your old phone, using not only cookies, but also browser or device fingerprints makes it possible to track you across the web. The massive amount of data that is collected through ad networks or social media is so huge that they can no longer be interpreted using spreadsheets. Analyzing big data using modern algorithms and machine learning helps us, for example, to better predict the weather or find similarities in images and offering many great services. But big data analytics can also be used to predict purchasing decisions or to calculate social scores. So for both developers and users, it is important to keep in mind that in analyzing data, we usually deal with correlations and not with causality. Correlations are statistical values that are in relation to each other. Let's have a look at an example. If we observe different seasons and look at birth rates, then we will notice that in spring, many babies are born. Also in spring, you will notice more storks than in any other season, at least in Europe. So there is not only a correlation between the season and the numbers of babies and storks, but also between the numbers of storks and the number of babies. Therefore, you could conclude that storks are responsible for delivering babies, which is of course total nonsense. So what we can explain statistically may seem as objective truth, but correlations only point to relations. They are unable to explain them. So looking at, for example, social or credit scoring, people are graded and assessed by statistical probability for certain dispositions, but not due to their true motives or attitudes. But ultimately, all these predictions that we get from big data analytics are coming from data that we generated in the past. Yet behavioral predictions that are based on these former choices are used to offer us products, jobs, or even partners on dating platforms, and so might compromise our freedom of action and choice as independent individuals. So it is really important for both developers and users to be aware of these problems related to algorithm-based recommendations or prognoses. Otherwise, statistical probability may shape reality as self-fulfilling prophecies, as we've already seen it, when big data is used for predictive policing or in recruitment, passing on human biases to data models and algorithms. Now, let me quickly show you one example from my channel on how easy it is to create biased data models. Last year, and with the best interests in mind, we created a machine learning model that could determine if a user had opened or closed his or her hand from a live camera image. We then used its predictions to play or pause a video. Clearly, the goal of this tutorial was supposed to show you how to create and use machine learning models. But looking at the dataset we used to train the model, 
there were no hands of various sizes, no hands of children, no different skin colors, no rings. I made clear that the data set I used was only for tutorial purposes, but the example underlines the responsibility of the whole software development community. We need to think about the contrasts of, for example, individualized offerings and manipulation, self-fulfilling prophecies and investigation of causes, instruments of power and democratic regulation, and data as capital of powerful companies or as collective good. We also need to be aware of ethical implications and questions about the usage of data in certain situations, like the determination of psychological dispositions, resilience, sexual preferences, or risks of crime. We even need to think about the ownership of data about nature and technology, like already the case with certain DNA sequences or enzymes. It's definitely hard for the average user to make sure that everything that they use is works for them. And even if um, a privacy policy makes them uncomfortable, it's so difficult to avoid certain services in the world that might just require you to agree to them. So it's not necessarily you agreeing to them as them telling you what they're going to use with your data regardless, even if you're not on the service. The predicament you just heard about is not uncommon. There are companies out there who think that privacy is just security and that you can use or collect data as long as you protect it. But security alone isn't adequate in the long run. Of course, you have to protect the data you collect, but it's less risky to just not collect them in the first place. Other companies define privacy as just transparency and control. This is the perspective that Cuba talked about. Let users know what you're doing with their data and let them opt out if they don't like it. This, however, forces people to choose between privacy and features. But if we believe in privacy as a fundamental human right and that privacy is essential for our societies, then we must make sure that privacy is part of how we design software. So designing for privacy means to minimize the amount of data you collect. That means that you have to carefully examine what data you need for the functionality of your app and what data can be edited out. Especially on iOS, you can rely on the power of on-device intelligence. Bringing, let's say, your machine learning model to the device has additional benefits like really fast inferences, you have no internet connection latency, and all of that without collecting user data. And with CoreML, you can even perform further on-device training without compromising your user's privacy. And last but not least, you need to be transparent and give your users control over that data. I know all of this can be challenging, but with Privacy Flash Pro, the tool I introduced in the last video, you will have a way to introduce privacy and especially the aspect of transparency into your workflow. With all that being said, from a theoretical point of view, let's hear one more insight into the current status quo from the head of Privacy Tech Lab, Sebastian Zimek. I can also say from a company's perspective, so I'm talking a lot you know, to, to people from industry, um, it is clear that you have to address privacy. Um, and even, even if you don't think of privacy as a human right and of you know, this, this big value that is being uh, you know, uh, upheld, it ultimately becomes a business decision, right? Um, companies like Facebook or Google um, who uh, collect uh, data are very well aware um, that there need to be privacy protection in place um, because otherwise, uh, you know, that will just uh, not work over the long run. Uh, people will not accept that. Um, and so I think uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, that was not so clear and people tried to grow as fast, get as many users as fast as possible, but the times have changed now. Um, and that is also the reason why we have, for example, uh, as Raf mentioned, the California Consumer Privacy Act um, uh, that that is developing because it is recognized that um, that you know there is a problem and that needs to be done something about that. So if you're still up and around at the end of this video, I'd like to thank you for your attention by watching this. 
you're already taking a step towards understanding and shaping the world of data in a human-friendly way. The way I see it, there is a risk that the growing awareness of digital exposure may negatively affect people's experience of digital technologies, decrease their trust in online services. But trust and goodwill can be maintained by respecting user data, providing them with transparency and control over their information, and so leading to an individually controlled balance between the promises and perils of the digital age. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.